So I wanted to say hello all, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Lexi Johnson and I'm the curator at the One Archives at the USC Libraries. I'm delighted to have Ben Quibbs joining me for the first in the series of conversations as part of the exhibition Safer at Home. For the exhibition, which I've been creating in real time, I've been selecting items from the One Archives collection that resonate with and reflect on the ideas of Safer at Home. While the exhibition began as a way to reflect on the ordinance issued as a response to the coronavirus pandemic, it now applies equally to the protests in response to police brutality. They are, of course, inseparable. COVID-19 is disproportionately affecting marginalized individuals. Police are killing black and brown and trans individuals. Thus, I wanted to probe what safer at home means in a world shaped by structural racism, classism, sexism, homophobia, and transphobia. Whose safety? Whose home? As defined by whom? Using archival material as a lens, this project will continue to pose questions and challenge ideas about space, place, and activity in relationship to safety and freedom. These archival materials act as a mirror, bringing the past into the present and offering perspective on what is happening today. They highlight people, events, and activities from the past, but offer inspiration and comfort, as well as challenge in the present. To complement these archival selections, I thought it was essential to include the voices of queer of color contemporary LA-based artists in this project. I have invited four artists to participate and their work is available online in the exhibition. In addition to today's conversation, I am planning an in-person exhibition of all of these materials when it is safe to do so. I wanted to do something generative now, but also offer the opportunity to see these items in person as well as something to look forward to and a way to continue this conversation. Before I introduce Ben and we dive into today's conversation, I want to make a few housekeeping remarks. This conversation is meant to be about 30 minutes. Ben and I will discuss his work, thoughts, and reflections on the current moment. There may be time for one to two questions at the end, but I encourage everyone to post all their questions into the Q&A box. If, you don't, if we don't get to them during our live conversation, we will try to answer them offline and make the answers available afterwards online via social media or other platforms. This conversation is also being recorded and will be available for viewing later. And now, as a way to begin, just a bit about Ben. He is a Los Angeles-based artist working in textiles, sculpture, installation, photography, video, sound, and performance. His practice underscores queer feminist ideologies with focus on the condition of embodiment. As a queer, non-binary, HIV-positive Latinx artist, his identity directly influences his work, which is often autobiographical. Born in Riverside, California in 1987 to a Jewish mother and a Puerto Rican father, he received a Bachelor of Arts in Mixed Media Installation Art from Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts in 2010. Afterward, he was awarded an artist residency at the Wasaik Project in New York State. There, he knitted his masterwork to date, a complete human skeleton. Since then, he has created several bodies of work, exhibited widely, and used his art as activism to raise awareness around issues of HIV AIDS. Several books and publications feature Cuevas's work, such as Duets, Ben Cuevas and Annie Sprinkle in Conversation, published by Visual AIDS, Queer Threads, Crafting Identity and Community, and Unraveled. You can learn more by following him at bencuevas underscore art on Instagram or via his website, bencuevas.com. Thank you so much, Ben, for agreeing to be part of this project and agreeing to talk with me today. Lexi, thank you so much for having me today. It's an honor to be here, and um, I'm just so grateful to have the opportunity to, um, to have a platform to speak with you today. And which just kind of gets me thinking of like the first thought off my head, which is like, as people the platforms, I think we just have to acknowledge what is happening in the world right now. Um, there is a huge response to, you know, systemic racism and injustice and oppression. Um, and I think, um, you know, for a lot of us who are dealing with this question of safer at home, um, who maybe aren't able to go out into the streets and um, be on the front lines of, um, you know, protest and direct action. Um, we're wondering what we can do 
Um, so if people go to my Instagram, um, I, I found this really great like copy paste meme post that has all of these ways that we can make a difference even if there are reasons that we're not able to put our feet on the ground right now. Everything from donating to bail funds um, to um, you know, volunteering at uh, non-hot zone areas to supply food and water. Um, and there are a bunch of organizations um, listed that you can donate to, too, that can definitely use funds to uh, affect change at this time. So, yeah, first things first. Great, totally. And I think we're interested in focusing on a lot of those issues here in, in today's present conversation as well. So maybe to get us started, I'm going to first screen share so that you can see Ben's work. Put this up for us. And we can start by talking about the series that's highlighted in the exhibition that you've graciously shared with us. And so this is part of your series Reinserted, or Ben's series Reinserted. Um, and to me, a lot of the current concerns around place and space and freedom are at play in a Reinserted series. So I thought we could start off the conversation by just having you tell me and everybody here um, a little bit about the project, how the idea came about, and uh, how it's progressing. Absolutely. Um, so in this reinserted series, I uh, take the subjects of archival images um, and I reinsert them into photographs that I take in the present day. And the subjects that I'm looking at specifically are people who are engaging in sex work or um, cruising for sex in public spaces and specifically spaces that have historical significance in terms of being places um, for uh, sexual exchange, be it for money or otherwise. Um, so this image here um, features a um, street hustler from the uh, photograph from the archive of Pat Rocco, which is part of the uh, one archive, so USC. And um, I stumbled upon it in my research there and thought it would be perfect for the project. And um, yeah, so he, uh, this gentleman is um, standing on a corner at, at Selma Avenue um, in the original. And I went to what is probably more or less the same location today. Um, and uh, on this block, there used to be the, um, the famed uh, hustler bar, the Spotlight. And standing in its place now is a uh, you know luxury hotel chain and more construction happening, and uh, a really just sort of like bougie gentrified um, uh, bar restaurant I think. Um, so I, I just wanted to see what happens when we take people from the past and bring them into the present um, in order to you know embody this history. Great. Now that's, um, I find the series very provocative. And one of the things that I wanted to talk about here maybe first is the use of archival material, obviously as an archivist and working at the archive, but also just in general thinking about how these archival materials and historical materials carry weight and power and how we feel like you're able to mobilize or embody some of that energy in creating works like this. Absolutely. Um, so I think I first started using archival imagery in my work in an uh, installation I did called Ghosts of the Trucks of the Left Side Highway, um, where I was working with um, the idea of truck cruising in New York City in the 70s. Um, and that piece was a sort of um, digital time travel or time travel through digital photo manipulation in a way. Um, and that is a theme that I'm carrying through into this work as well. So, you know, I, as a queer person who grew up um, do, during the AIDS epidemic, um, I think I've always kind of had this desire to time travel to that, that point in gay liberation in between Stonewall and AIDS, uh, just because it's in, it, it's, I think, often romanticized in queer culture as a time when there was so much freedom and exploration of sexuality. Um, so out of that longing kind of came my desire to, um, to time travel in a way. And that's kind of what I'm doing through, through this work. Um, and uh, in doing that, it also gives, you know, presence to, um, and, and you know, current life to work from the archives. Um, you know, I think a, a lot of times, 
in archives, like things can either just stay there or, or like they're, they're looked at for research and written about. But uh, they don't get; it always get embodied in a in a visual sense. Um, so that's something that I'm trying to do in this work, and it's also really incredible to have the opportunity to collaborate with people um, across decades, and um, to work with you know artists who have I've looked up to for some time, like Annie Sprinkle. Um, she's another artist whose archive I've worked with in this, this work. So to be able to, you know, collaborate with your idols, but then also to be able to discover people like Pat Rocco, who I wasn't familiar with his work before I started the series. Um, it's really incredible to be able to have that process of discovery and to, um, you know, find new collaborative partners in places where you might have not expected to find them. It's Totally. And um, I think for me too, like the archival materials, what's amazing about either archival or art materials is they created in a certain moment and they exist in the present and we can interact with them, recreate them, re-embody them now as well. And so maybe on the, on the topic of embodiment um, and physicality here today, we're seeing your work only via a screen, but in real life, these works are really large. And so maybe I was thinking you could talk and share a little bit about the choice of scale and also production process in creating these and how that went into putting together um, these works in a way that speak to kind of the, the questions and comments that you're just sharing with us. Totally. So as you said, these works are, uh, they're printed very large. And when you see them in person, they're uh, 60 inches by 40 inches, um, which is an interesting scale for a few reasons. Um, I think first, it's kind of like, Getting, it's kind of pretty close to a human scale. Like there are people who themselves are 60 inches by 40 inches, um, maybe with arms outstretched. Um, and uh, so you, I think you start thinking of your own self, your own body in a relationship to the idea of um, image as object. And um, I, I, I think that there's a, a certain uh, weight and presence that art at that scale has. Um, and especially in this work, I wanted people to, um, you know, not just look at this as something like small, something that could fit in like an accordion file or something, you know, like I wanted people to think of this as something not larger than life, but maybe as large as life. Um, it just speaks to the idea of, you know, this history is still alive and still living. Like the people who were you know, selling sex or cruising for sex in these places, like those energies linger, They're, those energies are still there. Um, and then in terms of process itself, um, you know, I first find an image in the archive, then I figure out where it was taken, then I go to that place, take the photograph, and then I bring it all into the computer. So I'm digitizing a like analog embodied, um, piece of media and then taking my digital media from the present day that I created by taking the photograph from the location and then merging them together in Photoshop. Um, and uh, so there's all of this interplay between the digital and the analog, the, um, you know, the corporeal and the ephemeral. Um, and uh, when I was thinking in terms of printing these works, I had to deal with the issue of, um, of like lossiness. So when you're, uh, you know, scanning in archival material, you, can, uh, you often don't have great resolution because things are maybe printed on, you know, small pieces of paper or, um, you know, even a 35 millimeter film slide, you can only get so much resolution out of. So uh, in order to get around that, I decided to, you know, move, go towards this idea of um, like a lo-fi aesthetic and specifically uh, the idea of halftone dots. Um, so I was really inspired by artists like Sigmar Polka um, of the capitalist realist movement in Germany, whose uh, work was responding to the beginning of consumer culture uh, in West Germany. Um, and artists like Lichtenstein in uh, the US whose work in pop art used a lot of Half tone and Bendai dots, um, which are all um, you know affectations of printing processes that um, 
you know, really aren't used as widely anymore now that things are digital. But uh, these analog printing processes created all of these tiny little dots. And it, those tiny little dots ended up being a perfect way to turn a problem into a um, part of the aesthetic of the, of the project and to you know, speak to this history of um, art that critiques capitalism. And this, my, I think my work also does that. Um, you know, it's uh, talking about, you know, ideas of um, like the body as commodity and sex as exchange and what is or isn't appropriate in a certain time in a certain society um, for people often who are often marginalized to do in order to, you know, put bread on their tables and roofs over their heads. Yep, and here I'm just showing a detail so that everyone can see the kind of the dotty, dottiness of the halftone print, which isn't really visible in the full print shared via digital means. Yeah, it's one of those things that's so hard to convey digitally. And I think one of the other interesting things that I'm thinking about, about digital versus non-digital, but also just trying to negotiate that past and present relationship and the questions that come up too is how this image makes you kind of think and in this moment we're being bombarded more than ever maybe before with images and so the kind of questions that it elicits in terms of thinking through what we're actually seeing and who we're actually seeing and so I think we'd be maybe remiss if we didn't talk too about kind of sex work and the specifics and here we have a white uh, cis man but that's obviously not the only kind of hustlers or people sex workers who you're including in your series so maybe we could think to you about um, space and people and past and present and how those frictions become even more apparent in this series and have kind of big ramifications for the present moment too. Absolutely, yeah. I think the idea of representation is really important um, in visual media and uh, you know, culture in general. Um, so it, when this image was um, originally exhibited, it was shown alongside one of Annie Sprinkle's images, which features a uh, a woman of color um, who is most likely trans because she was working at a um, a peep show that was you know famous for being a trans peep show, um, and uh, so it features her. And then there are like white people shopping around her in a Sephora. Um, so there's this interesting sort of um, you know back and forth in terms of ideas of race and representation. Um, it's definitely a challenge to represent um, race in terms of sex work and archival material because you're dealing with several layers of, um, you know, marginalization and several layers of um, people who are who are othered. Um, so people who are, you know, dealing with issues of marginalization often don't want to be pictured or. Um, depicted in media and in an archival sort of a way. Um, so it's definitely a challenge to find those images in the first place. Um, but it's something that I feel is really important because um, I think whenever, at, just as you know, creators of culture, we need to be thinking whose stories are we telling, um, what narratives are we privileging. Um, and uh, in order to you know, just tell more complete stories, yeah, and here in this image too, I mean, obviously the the man is white, but then you've chosen to put him into a scene that has a kind of African-American woman on her cell phone in the distance in relationship to, as you said, a kind of gentrified um, location and one that's being built up. So even though um, the archival material in this case might be of a certain kind of depicting a certain kind of representation, there's a way in which you start to open that conversation um, by putting it in this photograph, I'm sure you could have chosen a photograph of the present day that didn't include the woman on the right. Right, absolutely. Yeah, and I think it just, um, you know, it, it creates a more uh, active um, presence, I think, when, you, when you're able to merge pe like people from the past and the present together. Um, and I think it also kind of makes me think about how um, how much ideas around race and culture have changed and how much they also haven't. Um, you know, like a lot, there has been progress in several ways, but um, in a lot of ways, things are still as messed up as they've always been. 
Certainly, I know in conversations preparing for this conversation, you've also talked a lot about um, how this is a continuing series and that you started it before the pandemic and the police protests of recent weekend. Um, but a lot of the questions that you were asking before are even more kind of apparent in the general population, perhaps, or we hope now than before, but those questions remain. And so I wanted to ask maybe your reflections about what has changed and what has stayed the same since these two episodes of recent note and how that kind of continues to evolve in terms of the work that you're thinking about going forward. Totally. Well, I think about it in relation to that central like idea of safer at home behind this conversation series where before I was just thinking of it in relation to the coronavirus, but now I'm thinking of it in relationship to, um, you know, protest and uprising uh, as well. And, um, you know, who, who is safer at home? Certainly for somebody who is part of like higher risk groups for exposure to COVID like me, um, it's definitely safer to stay at home. Um, but, you know, for somebody who, you know, needs diapers for their baby and has been out of work for, you know, weeks now, and um, they have an opportunity to, you know, get what they need from a Target and um, Minnesota, you know, maybe for that person, it, uh, in order to get their needs met, being staying at home isn't safer. Um, or, uh, you know, for people who uh, have uh, just, you know, need to put their feet to the ground to get the, the word out about, you know, raising awareness around police brutality. And um, uh, is, it, is it safer for them to stay at home or, or to, um, to go out there and affect change, you know? Certainly, and it seems, yeah, there's a role. Safe, safety, as I said in my intro, um, defined by whom and for whom, and both safety and home have all sorts of different connotations, and there's roles that all of us need to take, um, be it staying, quote unquote, in our own home, apartment, or going out to the streets that um, ensure the safety that we require um, or need or want to demand. So I think all of those things kind of come into play. Absolutely. And it's interesting to think of safer at home in relationship to sex work specifically, too. Um, because if you look at like the time and sex work that I'm depicting um, in this work here, when it was very much uh, street-based and um, you know uh, like peep show and like real flesh space uh, based thing, whereas now so much sex work has gone online even before COVID-19. Um, you know, people have gone from the streets to the internet in terms of. Um, you know, listing their availability and uh, looking for clients and that kind of thing. Um, so in many ways that is safer, um, but in, in other ways it poses, it poses other challenges and especially in relationship to uh, COVID-19 now, you know, there are a lot of sex workers who aren't able to make the transition to, you know, camming or working online and doing live sessions. Um, there are people who have to make the decision to go out there and you know work in person still and um, I, I think it just speaks to the need for mm, a bigger social safety net um, on a very high <laughs> level you know like the uh, the bills that were passed for uh, the stimulus uh, totally explicitly ban people who do any kind of live performance for um, I think of a purient sexual nature was the word they used. Um, so, you know, really, if you're doing any kind of sex work, the government is saying, sorry, you're on your own. And it's bad public policy, and it's bad public health. And, um, you know, we, it's just one of the many ways in which we really need a big paradigm shift. Certainly, I couldn't agree more and hope for the paradigm shift coming soon. And so maybe as a segue here to our final question, I want to be mindful of the time and everyone's time who's here with us today or watching this as a recording. I just wanted to ask, um, obviously, as an art historian, I'm always invested in visual material and visual culture. But um, for you as an artist, I wanted to think about, from your perspective, what can art do for us in these times and what drives you to keep making work? Um, because for me, um, visual art and artists remain an integral part of our fight against all forms of oppression. So I think maybe that would be a, a place to close for today's conversation. Absolutely. Yeah, I think um, 
<laughs> art can give us hope. I think art can incite change and the ideas um, that go behind art. I think when you start talking about them, um, you start to talk about some of the, you know, the very serious issues of the day. And um, I think that we still need artists in order to continue reflecting and, um, you know, moving forward uh, the conversation. And, um, and even before this, I think what keeps me making work is the idea of legacy, the idea of, um, you know, having made a mark on the world in this time that we get in an embodied form. And I love that through this work, specifically in the reinserted series, I'm able to work with other artists' legacies and um, help embody them in the present day and speak to them in the current moment as well. Well said. Um, thank you so much, Ben, for joining. Um, thanks for those for coming to the live session. And I look forward to a continued conversation in other forms and platforms and the exhibition in person whenever it's safe to do so. So thanks again. Thank you so much for having me.